panelists will challenge us to think anew about exile, which has become almost unthinkable under the enormous social and political pressures and global differences. Yet exile is deeply, deeply rooted in the human condition and history, and as such remains constantly present and always individual. Or rather both communal and subjective alike. As Julia Kristeva has it, our present age is one of exile. I am Tomek Kiczynski, after political intimidations in Poland, now in exile in Berlin, member of the Academy in Exile and the new University in Exile Consortium. I will be introducing our speakers and their trajectories. Our panelists will share with us their visions or experiences of exile. We would be most obliged if each panelist would speak for 15 minutes to give us enough time for a Q&A after all panelists speak. Please pose your questions in the chat. Our first panelist is Mohamed Mustafa Alapsi, a refugee from Syria, trained in political philosophy. He recently received his doctorate from the University Grenoble Alp. He's currently editing the Arabic Encyclopedia of Political Philosophy. For the past year, Dr. Alapsi has been affiliated with Columbia University's Global Centers, Aman Jordan. He is also a member of the new University in Exile Consortium. Mustafa, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tomek. And uh, I want to thank uh, uh, the uh, uh, Kulturwissenschaft Institute uh, in Essen. I want to thank Tomek, the organizers, uh, as well as uh, the guests, the audience. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, uh, the University in Exile in Berlin and especially Melonship Foundation that gave me that opportunity as an exiled um, scholar to begin my career. And also uh, the new University in Exile in New York, uh, thanks to which my career is beginning very, very well. Uh, so I'm very lucky. Um, I will uh, start by um, uh, presenting myself. Presenting myself. Uh, my name is Mohamed Mustafa Rapsi, as you said. Uh, I'm from Syria, so I'm exiled on both dimensions. Uh, citizen, uh, ex uh, I'm exiled as a citizen and as a scholar. Because uh, citizen in Syria, in fact, uh, military service is mandatory. So if I go, I try to go to Syria now, I will uh, get to the army directly. I will engage in the army and I will fight it against other people, other Syrians. And uh, especially um, uh, I cannot fight uh, along with uh, the regime army. And in general, uh, I don't want to fight uh, at all um, against violence. So this is the citizenship exile, exile situation. And uh, on the other hand, as a, school, as a scholar, uh, my field is about Middle Eastern studies, the theory of, of the state, the constitutional device, and the theory of democracy, etc., in the Middle East. So uh, this is a forbidden subject in, uh, uh, in actual, in present day Syria. Uh, this is something that is fought. Uh, and uh, so uh, they know my name. I'm not a famous activist. I'm not a famous scholar, but they know my name. I received some uh, soft uh, uh, threats, uh, so it's not very dangerous. I live in Europe, uh, so I'm lucky again, uh, but I cannot go to Syria uh, either as a scholar or as a um, citizen. Uh, now I want to talk about uh, our uh, seminar subject today, uh, and uh, it's about exile, uh, inspiration from Julia Kristeva. I want to say that uh, I, I never read a whole book of Julia Kristeva, so I, I read about her. I know uh, some themes about her and about her writings. Uh, so to get inspired, I read uh, many articles about her work. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, related to the subject of today, the estrangement to the self or uh, 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 strangers to ourselves. Uh, 
uh, or um, uh, it's uh, the, the putting uh, putting any suffering experience uh, into words into literature in order to make it positive uh, and to make uh, uh, optimism. Uh, this is something very sp inspiring, and I also at the same time I read uh, uh, an article that I know uh, before I knew before we refugee of Hannah Hannah Arendt. Um, and that was also about a personal and collective experience uh, of very high and uh, of high intellectual value because uh, we can and universal value be, value because Arendt when when she entitled her, her article she didn't say we Jews she says we refugees and that's why uh, she's a great and a patient uh, patient she's a great thinker and philosopher. Uh, I want to talk so in, in inspired from what I read uh, uh, during uh, two, uh, two last weeks, Kristeva or Arendt, I thought about uh, the historical experience as a theme uh, because it's related, related to my field of um, my, my field of studies. Uh, historical experience because I think that uh, any historical experience which is not uh, commented and uh, analyzed in a critical way uh, uh, couldn't have any uh, philosophical value and could teach nothing to future generations. Uh, and uh, also any, uh, any personal experience uh, which is not told uh, could be uh, a permanent uh, uh, reason of suffering. Uh, and this, is, this, is, uh, this is something we, we, all, uh, we all know. Uh, uh, to be honest, uh, I don't consider myself as a reference or an example to talk about uh, an experience of exile, uh, because I think I'm lucky. Uh, I know people. Uh, I know people from Syria uh, who uh, are still waiting for information about their relatives and uh, any information about their relatives or friends. They don't know even whether they are dead or alive. Uh, I also uh, know people uh, who uh, witnessed the killing or the death of one of their friends, uh, and they, they didn't get killed, so they are uh, they are still uh, suffering from some, from such experience. Uh, 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 for me, uh, I uh, I could bring my family to Europe. I have my future. I think. Uh, I'm safe, I'm in Europe, so I'm very lucky as an exiled scholar and uh, as an exiled uh, uh, individual. Um, th that's why I want to uh, talk about two points about exile. Uh, th there will be some uh, personal uh, side in them, but it will be also theoretical. Uh, the first point will be exile and war, and the second one will be exile and homeland. Uh, so about war, exile and war, uh, I came to Europe in 2007, so I left Syria four years before the Arab Springs or the Arab uprisings and the events and the war in Syria that became as uprising and end up, ended up as civil war. Uh, so as many of you, I watched uh, the uh, events in Syria on TV, on YouTube, uh, and it was really hell. And here I remember the the, 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 the phrase of Hannah Arendt when she says, hell is no longer a religious belief or a fantasy, but something as real as houses and stones and trees. Uh, this is the same text, uh, We Refugees, uh, um, published in 43. Uh, uh, the difference when I was watching uh, the war in Syria on TV, I was not between the walls uh, under destruction. I was not under under the, the bombs, for example, so I was lucky. But at the same time, I was uh, witnessing, in fact, the destruction of my, my memory because uh, I was watching something that belonged to the past and something, uh, a place uh, where I could go back again and find again, uh, uh, to quote Aaron, the familiarity of my, uh, uh, of my um, uh, everyday life, for example. Uh, but uh, all of that was under destruction. And this is a very weird kind of exile because it's not only an exi a physical exile when you are forced or, forced, uh, or, or uh, unable to go back to your country, uh, even your memory being destroyed. This is something very, very complicated as, uh, as a feeling. Uh, and we can find some consolation in literature. Uh, and we can say to ourselves, everyone has his 
Paradise Lost. Uh, and here I, I want to quote also Marcel Proust, who says, the only true paradise is paradise lost. But in the case of Syria and in the case of civil war, now because we began talking about, about hell, uh, civil war, and we went back now to paradise with Marcel Proust and with the with the, with lost paradise with the lost paradise. Uh, the problem here was that even the notion uh, of paradise lost was forbidden for me. I was forbidden for every Syrian, I think. And this is this is very personal, but uh, I think that paradise cannot lead to hell. And that's why even the idea of paradise and the possibility of considering that place as a lost paradise, even that possibility is lost, is also lost. Uh, so no paradise and no idea of, of dreaming of lost paradise. And that was all over. And is, this is very, very uh, different way uh, or, or, or a different dimension of being, uh, of leaving uh, or, or experiencing exile, because civil war is not something that happens uh, every 10 years. It's something that happens every, every, I don't know, every 10 generations. It's very, very particular as experience. And I reiterate, I'm very lucky to be here in Europe, to have all my family and to have my future in front of me and not to have lost anybody. So, uh, but I, I wanted to talk about that very personal uh, side in, in, in that experience that paradise cannot lead to hell uh, that all our past was lies it was not beautiful it was beautiful before the war in 2010 i was saying oh i left syria i was happy it was beautiful uh, i want to go back again i want to, to 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 find my neighborhood my my friends my my i don't know everything that uh, i was used to watch and to see and to communicate with even all of that uh, is considered now as lies. And this is very weird to say that all the past was lies because that past led to a civil war. That So that past is not legitimate anymore. And yeah, this is a very particular side that I lived for uh, under uh, the, the, the situation of exile and war. And that makes me go to the second point. Yeah. Yeah, there is also a point that given that the Middle East was my field of expertise, I had uh, to leave all of that in a cold and insensitive way. I was forcing myself to keep uh, cold in front of all that because I cannot think about these events without being cold and insensitive. And this is also another, I don't know, I don't know if I succeeded. I don't know if I'm not very emotional in refusing all kind of emotion. I don't know. But this is also uh, something that uh, was added to my personal experience, a lucky experience of exile. So I can imagine people who lost people, who lost relatives and, and etc. Uh, the second point is about exile and homeland. Uh, uh, exile and homeland because uh, 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 once uh, I, I, I considered our past uh, historical experience in the Middle East, in fact, we lived under a regime uh, uh, whose narrative, the Ba'ath regime uh, from 70, uh, the revolution was a revolution, the coup d'etat was in 63, uh, and then when, with Hafez al-Assad in 70 till 2000, and then we had his son. Uh, uh, under Hafez al-Assad, we had uh, an experience or a narrative uh, for, 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 for which uh, uh, all our public life was about uh, victories, defeats, wars, enemies, internal enemies, external enemies, Muslim Brotherhood inside. Uh, that was like uh, really like Orwellian because even the name is Brotherhood. So this is crazy. And external enemies. And before we had uh, satellite and other channels, we had only two channels. And we never saw as Syrian, Syrian people and Syrian society, we never, we never were allowed to see the face of our enemies. We had to imagine it. On the Syrian TV, you never see the face of uh, an Israeli prime minister. I don't even remember having seen uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the image of uh, American president, I don't know, but all of that will be part of my work because uh, I think that when, uh, once a political regime uh, is able to uh, alter the spontaneity of individuals, this is a totalitarian regime. And this is, uh, Arendt, uh, this is a, a point of view of Hannah Arendt. There are a lot of 
criteria from Aaron's point of view, but that will be part of my work because I, of my work because I I consider that these regimes uh, were uh, both in Syria and Iraq. I will check with Iraq also. That will be part of my future work. But I think we uh, went under uh, a totalitarian regime, and because that regime uh, could alter our spontaneity, and that's why I think we finished up with civil war and we couldn't. Uh, anticipate our future uh, and uh, uh, I'm sorry I, I, I lost uh, I lost my point and uh, and yeah uh, the idea of uh, uh, and even our private life was altered by uh, the narrative of the public life where we didn't have any political life uh, uh, we didn't have any spontaneity any free freedom of expression uh, and that's why I think uh, I, I consider that Syria didn't have um, um, uh, a strong civil society, if not to say we didn't have a civil society anymore, maybe that could be controversial, but we had really a very weak civil society, an invisible civil society or uh, 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 that couldn't protect uh, the society from, uh, from uh, the civil war. So we have been also exiled in our, our own homeland before the war. Uh, this is what I can say about exile. So uh, related to my, um, to my field, my personal project, which could be very modest because I'm only uh, an individual, I'm only one person, uh, I want to, uh, uh, to contribute to the, re the rebuilding uh, of uh, a future civil society that take the past as a lesson and as a historical experience to consider what uh, was going on in our uh, in our society, because we still have, we have many people who believe in democracy and who uh, who, prote who were protesting against the regime. We, but we still have many people who think about uh, 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 the enemy, the enemy as ideology, who think that uh, Bashar al-Assad is not a dictator. Uh, it's not because he's a dictator. Uh, the enemy is not the dictatorship. The enemy is the confession to which belong Bashar al-Assad. This is a problem we, we still have. Uh, and that's what, and I think that alteration of the spontaneity and that uh, alteration of, the, of all our representation, political representation uh, have, been, uh, have been altered uh, during uh, the uh, last three or four decades. And that's why I want to find um, uh, colleagues uh, from Europe, from the United States, from the Middle East, who wants to contribute each uh, to consider that this experience uh, again uh, and to, 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 to look at the future with optimism as uh, Kristeva, I think, uh, uh, sees also uh, 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 things and reality. Uh, and this, yeah, this is... Dr. Mustafa, our I, time is running up. So yeah, it's okay. Yeah, I finished. Conclude. I will Thank stop you there. very much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thanks to a moving personal testimony with generalizations towards uh, Marcel Proust, the protagonist of the origins of totalitarianism by Hannah Arendt, and we refugees by Hannah Arendt, which for sure will be uh, touched upon in Professor Volker Heinz's presentation. Thank you, Mustafa. Uh, I am honored to introduce to you uh, Professor Christina von Braun, born in Rome. Uh, until 1981, she lived as a freelance author and filmmaker in New York and Paris. She has offered 50 films and numerous books. Since 1994, she has been professor at Humboldt University. She founded and directed Gender Studies. Now, Christina von Braun is one of the founders and senior advisor of Zelma Stern Center for Jewish Studies. Christina von Braun's research examines the mental and political life of the other. She's particularly interested in looking at strangers from the perspective of gender and sexuality. Professor von Braun's research focuses on the experience of Jews in the diaspora. 
She has also worked with Palestinians in Ramallah. Uh, Professor von Braun, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Pavel. Thank you very much, Tomek, for inviting me to this panel. After having heard this very touching uh, uh, witness uh, speak, I will turn to a more historical perspective, and I hope it doesn't throw you off the line too much. Um, migration existence in the diaspora refuge is, uh, uh, is an experience which is very evident and very strong and long in, in, Jewish, in uh, Jewish history, and this is what I will uh, focus on. Uh, within Jewish culture, there was a great debate about whether the diaspora was a blessing or a calamity for the community, a part of the Jews regarded as God's punishment. Others, like the great scholar Rashi, who wrote the most important commentary of the Middle Ages on the Tanakh and Talmud, saw in diaspora a chance of survival. A scattered people cannot be wiped out with one blow. This confidence was to prove true even in the Holocaust. Still others understood the dispersion as a chance to spread the idea of monotheism to the world. And this possibility was indeed inherent in the original meaning of diaspora in the sense of sowing distribution of the seed. One of the first to take up a different idea was the Russian historian Simon Dubnov, who wrote a world history of the Jewish people in the early 20th century. In a 1931 article on the topic of diaspora, he described it as the cultural ferment and force for progress within a given society. After Jews had been concerned for centuries with the consequences of the diaspora for Judaism, he now turned the perspective around and asked about its significance and benefit for other cultures. What Dubno failed to remark, however, was that the ferment of diaspora also had an effect on Judaism. Judaism drew its power of renewal, not least from the dispersion, the concomitant need for self-reflection and the permanent updating of its teachings. This is precisely why the example of Jewish history is so topical today. There is no other religious or cultural community that has such a long and varied experience with the hardships and fears of migration, as well as with the enrichment it brings. Already during the exile in Babylon, that is from the 6th century BC on, Judaism developed guidelines in a grand narrative, the stories of the Bible, especially Exodus, who living not only in, but with a foreign society. The strategies developed to meet these needs became a prerequisite for something as paradoxical as a migratory homeland. This is one aspect of the Jewish history, the Jewish history teaches us. The other relates to the Holocaust as the traumatic experience of Judaism par excellence. If there's anything at all that compares to this trauma, you have to go very far back to the destruction of the second temple at the beginning of the Jewish diaspora 2000 years ago. At that time, the rabbis developed a new code for the coherence of the Jewish community and the survival of its culture, despite the lack of a homeland. It contained three crucial innovations. For one, the centralized cult in the temple was replaced by a decentralized place of worship in the synagogue. At the same time, access to the Holy Scripture was democratized. The reading of the Torah was no longer reserved for the priestly elite, but was read aloud in the synagogue and became part of the general knowledge of the community. Thus, the ability to read and write became a general obligation, at least for the male members of the community. No other culture or religion in the ancient world had propagated universal literacy. In the diaspora, though, it became important 
for the word of God to dwell in each and every body of his people, as it is written in the book of Exodus. The scriptures, thus in the words of Emmanuel Levinas, substituted the ground by the letter. This decentralization, secondly, opened the path for a new diversity of interpretation. Since each synagogue was in a different cultural environment and the rules of the Torah had to be interpreted in such a way as to be compatible with the laws of the surrounding society, there emerged the polyphony for which the Talmud is famous. It has often been asked how come that the Jewish culture could preserve itself over such a long period of time and despite the many persecutions and expulsions. The other answer is it survived not in spite of, but because of dispersion and the cultural adaptability and flexibility that came with it. The third innovation was the introduction of the mother lineage. It was contrary to all the ideas of the ancient world, including that of biblical Judaism. The rabbis established matrilineality as the main principle of belonging to the Jewish community. Being Jewish was now defined as being born of a Jewish mother. This proof of affiliation united Judaism across all cultural differences. The matrilineal descent had the advantage of providing an unambiguous statement about origins. It is always known who is the mother of a child, while the patrilineal principle of the Greek, Roman and Christian societies had to struggle with the uncertainty of paternity. For the extraterritorial Jewish community, which had no native soil of its own, a portative motherland thus came to stand alongside the portative fatherland, as Heinrich Heine called the Torah. It took 200 years before this new set of rules was established, but it endured for over 2,000 years. A new Ju Judaism had emerged from the trauma. The 20th century trauma of the Shoah is still too close for us to be able to make any statements about a comparable healing process. A first answer, of course, was the creation of the state of Israel in 1948. Without the Shoah, the Zionist movement would never have succeeded in establishing its own state. Why Israel, the great Jewish philosopher and scholar Yeshayahu Leibovitz was asked after 1945. He answered, because we are sick and tired of living among the Goy. That was his succinct and clear reply. A second answer was of course the never again. It unites all Jewish groups today, be they religious or secular, whether they live in Israel or in the diaspora, and it includes even those who are not directly involved in the persecutions. But the question is, can the permanent actualization of the trauma be understood as a collective healing process? Instead, I would like to first focus on an aspect based on the research done on the individual trauma of survivors. In this context, and not long ago, the concept of post-traumatic growth has been developed. The term refers to the fact that in the aftermath of the traumatic experience, especially if that aftermath takes place in an empathetic environment, an intense affirmation of life often takes place and releases great creative forces. In these cases, it even turned out that the survivors had a higher life expectancy than the average population. These findings were the most surprising result of trauma research, stating that a part of the survivors of the Shoah, especially child survivors, managed to lead a successful professional and effective private life. Nobody had expected to come across such findings. They contradicted all previous insight into the consequences of trauma. And they showed that in the long run, 
the forces of life triumph over those of death. Possibly, and I say with all due caution, this concept can also be applied to the collective overcoming of a trauma. A communal post-traumatic growth could consist, for example, in the acceptance of the diversity of definitions of Jewishness. That is the coexistence of Israeli, diasporic, secular, cultural or religious, including orthodox, conservative, liberal Judaism. For the time being, this notion is not easily accepted or even unthinkable for many Jews. And yet it could be that this turns out to be an example of a collective post-traumatic growth, which moreover would be an appropriate answer to the Shoah based on a fixed idea about Jewishness. There's much to suggest that this may be what we are heading for. For one, there's the precursor of the Jewish polyphony of the Talmud. And secondly, this multiplicity could be a new communal feature of Judaism, distinguishing it, uh, distinguishing it from all other communities, be they religious, national, social, or otherwise. I'm not aware of any other community that disposes of so many options of defining itself. Perhaps it is utopian, but I would like to imagine that this diversity of self-definitions and the post-traumatic growth it implies might possibly set a tone for other exile experiences. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Christina von Braun. It was illuminating and inspirational about the unique experience of uh, the Jewish diaspora. Thank you so much. Uh, now to Professor Volker Heinz who is Professor of Political Science at the University of Duisburg, Essen, member of the Faculty of Social Sciences and fellow at the Institute for Cultural Studies there. He's also faculty fellow at the Center for Cultural Sociology, Yale University. Volker Heinz's research focuses on exile studies as well as migration and democracy. Among his recent publications, he's the author of Can the Refugee Speak? A clear reference to Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak's uh, title. Uh, the article appeared in Thesis 11. Professor Heinz has written this article in conversation with the ideas of uh, Hannah Arendt, in particular with her essay, We Refugees, and with the work of Judith Schlar. Uh, Professor Volker Heinz, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Tomek and Pavel. Thanks for having me tonight. Um, yeah, so I will try uh, yet another angle so after these first two uh, presentations we had, and so I'm um, I'm drawing inspiration actually not so much from Hannah Arendt, but you mentioned Judith Sklar, and then also um, Albert Hirschman, Jew Jewish yes. economist and political scientist, and they both were exiles, and they both um, wrote about this. And whereas Hannah Arendt is more more in the background in my case, and I I want to confine myself since I wrote about this already to um, basically two, two claims I want to make. So uh, more about the present age. And um, so the one is um, you know, comparatively upbeat. So I would, my thesis is that exiles nowadays no longer have to give up their dissident voices. That's something Hirschman uh, believed, you know? So exile for him was a situation of suffering and also of voicelessness, you know? So that's one thing. And the second thesis is that uh, increasingly the dominant form of exile is internal exile or exile at home. So just let me say a few words about these two things, okay? Um, 
So voicelessness was often described, even by Karl Marx and others who go further into the 19th century. So exiles could speak up and they did speak up, but their voice didn't resonate with the wider public, neither in their new host countries nor back home. Uh, as Judith Sklar wrote, for exiled intellectuals, there's no one to persuade, no followings to be organized. So this is voicelessness and loneliness. And I would claim that's something we can discuss that some of this has changed. Exile no longer necessarily implies the impossibility of voice. One could argue that the voice of exiles has never been completely silenced, of course. Think of Karl Marx, who wrote nearly 500 articles for the New York Tribune from his exile in London, some of them quite influential. So there are these cases. Russian writer Mikhail Bulgakov uh, wrote somewhat um, metaphorically, manuscripts don't burn. And that was a, a figure of speech, which nowadays has become true in a way in the age of uh, cloud-based storage services, the internet and so on. So it's much easier to silence people. Um, so the products of what Albert Hirschman called the art of voice are much easier to disseminate at a global scale today than hundred years ago. And this in turn helps to create new ways of exercising voice. Now, um, why is this? Why is voice more powerful today? One reason is that today refugee intellectuals are often only a small fraction of a much larger group of economic migrants from, from the same country. These migrants form a public of its own, which is more or less open to the voice of emigrated intellectuals. There are plenty of ways to establish person-to-person -person relations through what has been called horizontal voice. Perhaps more important is the development of new media formats as a consequence of migration. And many people have worked on this recently. For example, there's this um, German anthropologist, Kira Kosnick, who wrote about Alevi amateur television production uh, and Kurdish satellite TV stations in Germany, other European countries. Um, as a way to show and um, produce public dissent. So the contemporary public sphere should not be conceived as a bounded space, but rather in terms of technologically enhanced discursive flows passing through various national, subnational and transnational spheres and filters. So that's the upbeat part, okay? So now the, the, the other thing I wanted to mention briefly is um, exile, internal exile. And Tomek, we talked about this already privately. Um, so I would uh, say that more and more individuals live nowadays, live in exile without having physically left the country, which in some cases they do not even consider to be their own country anymore, but still they are stuck there. And I think that's something we should think about more. These internal exiles are forced to live under the jurisdiction of a repressive state, which means that they are condemned to a life of tacit dissent. So why do these dissidents stay where they are? In the past, the standard case was that dissidents were banned from traveling abroad. I'm German, so think of the GDR, very obvious case. And we still have a case, a case like this. So just um, very recently, Belarus um, enacted a travel ban for most of its own citizens, turning the country into a vast open air prison. But that's not the, the main case anymore. Mostly nowadays, it's countries in the West which no longer admit refugees. That's a, a situation. Which has, uh, got, which has developed in recent decades. And I don't go into details, so you, know, you all know what I mean. So we are witnessing what Canadian scholar Alison Mounts calls the death of asylum in a, in a recent fantastic book. And other migration researchers speak of coercive 
policies of sedentarization. So these are policies that make sure that potential migrants stay where they are. They stay at home or they are locked up in offshore detention centers and other facilities, preferably on remote islands. And we have cases of, uh, of course, also exiles and you know, what I call refugee intellectuals, the same situation. So we are not different from, from them. The death of, sil of asylum and coercive sedentarization will lead to an explosion of the phenomenon of internal exile. In itself, the figure of the exile who doesn't leave her home country is not new, of course. Obvious examples are internal exile of, of ex eternal exiles can be found among critical intellectuals in the former Soviet empire, of course. Lithuanian poet and philologist Thomas Van Klova claims that at some point, almost, and I quote from an interview he gave a while ago, any serious author or thinker was a covert or sometimes an overt oppositionalist. Um, so back to, to Sklar. Uh, she, I think she's, in, I, in preparing for tonight, I looked again at a couple of her articles. She offers a conception of exile that goes beyond physical flight and therefore better captures the great variety of harm being done to individuals who are exiled in one way or another. For her, exiles are citizens who, as a consequence of being betrayed by their governments, either leave the country or withdraw into themselves. And let me finish with a, with a quote, which I looked up for you tonight. So, um, Judith Sklar, I quote, to be sure, I have long been interested in betrayal and exiles are often created by governments that betray their own citizens. Governments also frequently abuse residents under their jurisdiction by denying them membership in the polity and other rights, not as a matter of legal punishments, but because they belong to a group that is thought to be inherently unfit for inclusion. These people are also exiles, even if they don't leave. In fact, the more one thinks about them, the more numerous the forms of exile turn out to be. Exile itself is but a part of a larger social category, ranging from the forcibly excluded to people who exile themselves without moving by escaping into themselves, as it were, because their world is so politically evil. So on, and on this note, pessimistic and <laughs> be note, I would like to end and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Heiss, for this uh, innovative uh, presentation of exile, including internal exile and all the categories of other exiles that we are experiencing right now. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, this is my pleasure as an art curator uh, to introduce Evgeny Fix, our next speaker, who is an artist. Um, Evgeny is a Jewish-Russian refugee artist who is based in New York, but he was raised in Moscow, where he started his artistic education as a social realist painter, but of course then continued his studies in the U.S. In 1994, he migrated to the US, becoming part of more diasporas, queer diaspora, Russian diaspora, and Jewish diaspora in New York. His work draws, draws on his experience as a political exile and as a member of LGBTQ community. Yevgeny Fix is particularly interested in exploring queerness from an exilic perspective, speaking about the experience of queerness on, on both sides of the Cold uh, War, on the Russian and the American side of the Cold War. So Yevgeny Fix offered many uh, incredible uh, art pieces about the experience of queerness and our experience of Jewishness from the position of conceptual artists. So we, and at the same time, 
Uh, he's a migrant artist working between cultures and now speaks uh, from the global queer culture perspective. So we are very happy to uh, have him among us today. So Evgeny, uh, the video screen is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Pavel. Uh, thank you so much, Pavel and Tomek for inviting me. It's very exciting and uh, uh, looking forward to sharing some images with you. Um, I would like today um, to go back a little bit also and uh, um, revisit some of the cases, some of the weird or queer cases of exiles of um, 20th century. And, uh, um, and I think it's fitting for this particular moment, but also historically, we are about um, two months away from the anniversary of the fall of the Soviet Union, which is uh, August 91. Uh, I have a feeling that not much will be um, you know, done uh, uh, in, in, in August uh, 2001 uh, about that particular anniversary, but, but in, in any case, um, I would like to present to you three cases of uh, queer exiles, you can say. Um, and uh, I'll start with, um, and um, so, and all these uh, cases of queer exiles, they are part of my artistic project. So I'm going to talk about three projects, three individuals uh, and an exile. And I would like to start with a project of mine called uh, the Wayland Rudd Collection. And it's a project about the representation of Africans and African-Americans in Soviet visual culture. Um, spanning about 60 years. So I've collected about 300 images of Soviet artists portraying or attempting to portray um, uh, Black Africans and African Americans in struggle, in life. And, uh, and the project is dedicated to, uh, to Wayland Rudd. Wayland Rudd um, was an African American actor a classically trained actor who um, moved to the Soviet Union in uh, 1932. He um, arrived with a group of uh, black intelligentsia, about 22 people to work on a Soviet uh, movie about race relations in the US and decided to stay. So he wanted to get out of the US. Um, if, uh, having you know bad experiences uh, um, as an actor in in 1930s 1920s united states so he came to the soviet union in 1932 and he remained so this is him uh, later probably in the 40s um and he appeared in several soviet movies uh, quite popular movies so this one was called the great consoler it's a movie from 1933, uh, right, uh, probably sec uh, next year after he arrived in the, into the Soviet Union. Uh, this is a, uh, a poster of that, of that movie, The Great Consoler. Um, and um, so Wayland Rudd, so he acted in Soviet movies, he acted on Soviet stage, including working with the famed Soviet director of Sevlet Meyerhold. Um, and um, uh, he also, so this is one of the uh, popular movie that he was in called The 15-Year-Old Captain. It's uh, uh, after uh, Jules Verne, um, it's based on Jules Verne novel. Um, and uh, um, he also appeared as a model in many of Soviet posters. Uh, he modeled for Soviet propaganda posters and so on, and would become also uh, a uh, um, subject of portraits uh, by, by famous Soviet artists. And um, so he stayed in the Soviet Union for the remainder of his life. He died in 19... 
52. Um, so of natural causes, he was young, he was only 51, 52 years old. Um, so the last 20 years of his life, he's, he stayed in the Soviet Union, he passed away in the Soviet Union. And this is a, um, a telegram informing of his death sent from, from another African-American exi um, exile in Moscow, um, Robert Robinson, and the telegram was sent to the, uh, the famous uh, African-American singer and activist Paul Robson in New York informing uh, him of uh, Wayland Rudd's passing. And uh, so Wayland Rudd was one of a group of large, rather large group of African-American expats or exiles in, in the Soviet Union. Uh, the community numbered around 200 people, more or less. So, uh, with, you know, with children and so on. Um, so the second uh, case I wanted to talk about is the case of American writer Ayn Rand. Um, and she's, uh, uh, she's a heroine of one of my projects called Ayn, uh, Ayn Rand in Illustrations. So Ayn Rand, um, she uh, was born in, in St. Petersburg, uh, Russia, Imperial Russia in 1905. Um, in a, in a Russian-speaking Jewish family, and um, was uh, terribly traumatized by the experience of the Russian Revolution. She saw, uh, you know, the, uh, the the ugliness of of you know struggle in the street, of the casualties out of her bedroom window on Nevsky Prospect, where she lived, uh, the the main avenue of of Saint Petersburg, and developed extreme, uh, extreme um, rejection of the Soviet experience of, of the revolution. So she was only 11, 12 when the revolution broke, but she describes her teenage years as, as someone who is precisely in this ex uh, internal exile, that she did, not, uh, she did not want to have anything to do with, with the Soviet experiment. Um, she hated everything about it, and she was able to get out uh, from the Soviet Union in 1926. So in, in, she came to Chicago at the age of 21 and, and stayed in the United States for the rest of her life. She um, uh, changed her name, and, uh, and uh, became uh, uh, one of the, you know, uh, the disciples of capitalism, right, of, of the free market, of individualism, a radical, radical um, uh, pro-capitalist activist in her writing, in her public speaking, and uh, she's known for her novels, The Fountainhead, uh, uh, The Atlas Shrugged, and so on. Um, now, um, I'm showing some of the images of my work in which I um, paired her quotations, quotations from her book Atlas Shrugged with some Soviet socialist realist imagery and, um, you know, creating, creating connections between um, uh, Ayn Rand's writing and uh, also her, um, uh, also the images that she rejected, the images of Soviet art that she rejected, but which nevertheless manifested themselves somehow in her writing as an exile in the United States in the 40s, uh, 50s, 60s, and on. So all images come from Soviet socialist realist art, from uh, uh, official Soviet art, and all uh, all quotations uh, come from Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. Uh, 
Um, and the third case that I, uh, the third case of, of, of queer exiles uh, that, um, that um, I'd like to uh, talk about is the case of, uh, of a British, um, uh, uh, British uh, spy for the Soviet Union, uh, Guy Burgess. Um, and uh, his story was part of my project called the Lenin Museum, which is the queer history of the Lenin Museum in Moscow, and also the queer history of Leninism or Lenin's uh, legacy. Uh, so this is the, the show. Um, and uh, and specific, specific uh, narrative, one of the narratives of, of the Lenin Museum, of the Queer Lenin Museum show is the story of Guy Burgess, an upper class, um, um, an, an upper class Brit who um, uh, starting in 1940s, I believe, uh, worked um, uh, for the Soviet intelligence um, while wor working in high positions um, of British media and uh, was uh, uh, attracted to communism and who fled uh, to the Soviet Union in 1951 and remained uh, for the, uh, um, till uh, his death in uh, 1963 in, in Moscow. Um, he was gay, um, he was upper class, uh, he was a, a, a communist believer. Um, so these, um, sketches that he left in his apartment uh, prior to fleeing uh, London. So uh, a sketch of Lenin, sketch of Stalin. Stalin says, I am very human. Uh, so this is how these uh, recreated sketches were presented in the exhibition. Um, and uh, the particular um, piece of the installation was dedicated to Guy Burgess's uh, boyfriend, uh, Soviet boyfriend in, in Moscow, who was a working class uh, Soviet man uh, with whom uh, Guy Burgess lived uh, after fleeing, uh, fleeing the UK. And these are some of the images of Guy Burgess um, in, uh, in Red Square in late 50s. Uh, Guy Burgess in, in the center in a, in a, um, in a grayish, uh, in a lighter jacket, coat. Um, and, um, and the last uh, few images that I would like to uh, uh, leave uh, you with are images of uh, another a project of mine called the Communist Guide to New York City. And this project is precisely about um, internal exile and um, internal exile and the history of American communist movement in New York as an experience of internal exile after the war, dur during the McCarthy era and on. Uh, so these are buildings of uh, buildings, public spaces with communist histories in New York City. And uh, they are div uh, they're empty. We do not see any people. Uh, so, so the communist history of New York is, is all voiceless or, or invisible or silent in, in the public, in the public uh, space.
and I will stop here. Th thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Yevgeny Fix, for, for your eye-opening presentation of very unobvious themes in, in exile. Uh, last but not least, my honor is to introduce Professor Kader uh, Konuk, who is professor and head of Turkish studies at the University of Duisburg, Essen. She's also director of uh, our academy in exile. In her book, East-West Mimesis, Auerbach in Turkey, Stanford University Press 2010, Professor Konuk discusses the experience of reciprocity in exile in the case of German Jewish emigration to Turkey with Vanessa Anu and Dane O. Newman. She has also co-edited a book, Refugee Roots, Telling, Looking, Protesting, Redressing. Professor Kader Konuk was professor of German studies and comparative literature at the University of Michigan. Professor Konuk, the floor is yours. Wonderful, thank you so much, um, Tomek and Pavel, for inviting me to this very distinguished group of speakers. And I really enjoyed every presentation. And uh, I was going back and forth between wanting to talk about today and wanting to talk about Auerbach and you inspired and encouraged me to go back to Auerbach in Turkey, which I'm going to do now. And I think maybe we all try to find some sustenance and some lessons from, from history, although we struggle with um, the new influx of exiles and uh, try to do our best to support them together with Volker Heinz, Vanessa Agnew, George Halil and Verena Blechinger Talcott. We have hosted 48 um, scholars in Germany, in Berlin and Essen so far. Um, eight more are going to come. We just had our decision, very difficult decision, which eight scholars to choose um, on this past Monday. And I also want to take the opportunity to um, thank everyone who was involved. So I'll start with going back to 1933, which is the year not only where um, uh, when uh, Germany uh, um, ousted, started ousting um, socialist and Jewish Germans from um, universities, but it's also the year in which um, Turkey decided to um, basically close the Darul Funun, which was the old Ottoman and most prestigious um, uh, institution for higher education. And um, in its place, um, we found Istanbul University as a modern secular national university. So modeling itself on the European system, Istanbul University was founded in that very same year, 1933, taking advantage of the flight from National Socialism, Turkish universities immediately hired more than 40 German scholars at Istanbul University alone to facilitate the westernization of tertiary institutions. These modernization measures steered by both Turkish reformers and German emigres promoted identification with Europe while simulta simultaneously emphasizing Turkishness as a common ground for the new nation. German emigres thus became mediators within Turkey's modernization process. The year 1933 was seen as the zero hour for modern Turkish tertiary education. The Ministry of Higher Education decided to curtail the autonomy of Ottoman Darul Finun, dismissed two thirds of its native faculty, renamed the institution Istanbul University and higher European professors and Turkish scholars trained in Europe. The initial suggestion had been to hire European scholars from a number of different countries. The hope was to avoid the cultural and political dominance of a single European nation. As it happened, however, the Turkish government quickly recognized that the expulsion of scholars from Nazi Germany could become Turkey's gain. The doors for an intellectual exchange between Turkey and Germany thus opened. Numerous Turkish reformers envisioned the transition from the Ottoman Empire to a westernized secular Turkey by drawing on the Renaissance model and attempting to integrate humanism into the Turkish pedagogical system. 
as mediators of European knowledge, philologists Leo Spitzer, Erich Auerbach, and numerous others were instrumental in creating a blueprint for humanist scholarship in Turkey. In so doing, they were faced with the question of how to generate mutual intelligibility and render humanistic scholarship suitable for Turkish purposes. This involved reconfiguring disciplinary practices so as to promote the Europeanization of scholarship in Turkey. Specifically, it meant adapting and introducing not only the teaching of classical and Western European languages and literatures, but also a set of analytical tools, academic writing styles, didactic methods, research libraries and other academic practices. Under the guidance of the German immigrants, Turkish students in the 1930s and early 40s would also develop a new awareness of history. The modernization measures steered by both Turkish reformers and German emigres promoted identification with Europe while simultaneously emphasizing Turkish origins as the common ground for the nation. We can say while Nazis ostracized Jewish scholars, arguing that they could not embody Germanness or even humanness, Turks celebrated them instead as representatives of European civilization and assigned them for some of the most important positions for the modernization of the country. However, while the Romance philologist Erich Auerbach trained students at Istanbul University in the humanist tradition, he did not necessarily support Turkey's attempt to sever its own cultural and historical roots. Auerbach's private correspondence indicates his specific concerns. Turkey's negative relationship to its own cultural tradition was, he wrote, sad for people like us, or even ghostly when compared to Germany. Auerbach understood why the eradication of the Ottoman cultural tradition may have seemed necessary for the modernization of the Republic. Nonetheless, he continued to be critical of Turkey for renouncing its Ottoman legacy, history and culture. During Auerbach's tenure in Istanbul, Turkish students were trained in Latin, Greek and Western European languages, but were no longer required to study Ottoman, Arabic and Persian texts. Such political decisions, he wrote in a letter to Walter Benjamin in 1936, contributed to the loss of historical consciousness and the standardization of culture. Responsible for the standardization of culture was, after all, Turkey's switch from the Arabic to the Roman alphabet and the establishment of the Institute for the Turkish Language that promoted the purification of the Turkish language by replacing Arabic and Persian vocabulary with Turkish. The act of recreating a high Turkish culture in the image of Europe, something that was mediated in many cases by German Jewish emigres, par paradoxically, is a compelling fact that demands reflection. Especially if we think that Turkish Jews were criticized in the 1920s and 30s as being resistant to assimilation. For this reason, they were subject to the ongoing pressure of displaying their loyalty to the Republic. Minority communities were subject to the wide-ranging Turkification measures of the early Republic. An assimilationist campaign was, for instance, initiated in 1928 in an effort to make Turkish Jews relinquish Ladino and speak Turkish instead. This was intended to establish the secular basis for Turkish citizenship so as to achieve a kind of isomorphism between culture, nation and geography. These assimilationist strategies notwithstanding inhabiting or representing Turkishness was ultimately reserved for Muslim citizens alone. That is to say, the boundaries of the ethnic Turk came to be drawn along religious lines. While Turkish minorities were thus purified from the body politic and extraneous elements became parasites, as Mark Bea argues, a different policy was applied to the hundreds of Jewish Germans and their families in Turkey. When German intellectuals first immigrated, they were not seen as parasites, but as facilitators of progress and as a means of bridging the gap between Western Europe and Turkey. Hence, the country enforced two competing forms of assimilationist politics. On the one hand, it required of its Turkish citizens, regardless of ethnic or religious origin, that they conform to a unified Turkish culture. On the other hand, it sought to implement an equally assimilationist modernization project that was designed to achieve cultural recognition from the heart of Europe. 
This insight takes us one step closer to understanding why Jewish German scholars were initially welcomed in Turkey, um, not as Jews, but as Europeans. For emigres such as Erich Auerbach, life in the foreign port was not without its tribulations. After two years in Istanbul, Auerbach summed up to the challenges of exile, I quote, the conservatives distrust us as foreigners, the fascists as emigres, the anti-fascists as Germans, and anti-Semitism exists too, end of quote. The typology Auerbach sets out here provides some indication as to the complex social political climate that prevailed at the time. In the first instance, it refers to the conservative reform leery Turks. Second, to the organized network of Istanbul Nazis who tried to curtail the activities of German emigres. And third, it refers to the anti fascist emigres. Anti Semitism, so the letter implies, crisscrossed all three of these circles. The challenge for Auerbach and other Jewish scholars stemmed, in other words, from their confrontation with various politically motivated groups in Turkey, each of which competed vigorously over the direction of the reforms. If the Turkish Ministry of Education had an investment in the emigres as scholars lacking any explicit national agenda, other groups in Turkey did not necessarily perceive them in quite such politically neutral terms. In order to make sure, as though necessary, that Auerbach abstained from national propagandizing, his contract with Istanbul University stipulated that he abstained from any political activities in Turkey. Actually, his contract had a paragraph stipulating exactly that. The emigre's privileged status in modern Turkey was hence contingent upon them agreeing to act as guests who did not pursue a national agenda of their own. Emigres shared with Turkish Jews the status of guests who were expected to refrain from promoting any national agenda other than Turkey's. Emigres hence enjoyed the privileges of a European intellectual under the condition of loyalty to the host country. This sense of obligatory loyalty perhaps explains why emigres tended to withhold substantive critique of the modernization reforms and why they did not expose the difficulties they faced at the university. Indeed, Auerbach rarely commented on Turkey in public and Turkey appears only peripherally in his published work. Only in his private letters do we find him critically assessing the country's reform measures nationalist politics and its anti-Semitism. Turkish reformers, it transpires, expected emigre scholars to act like people without a nation, people who could, as such, more easily implement Turkey's new national agenda. We can conclude then that in this transnational encounter, German Jews were actually denationalized and secularized before they came to stand for the idea of Europeanness. Reviewing his status in Turkey, Auerbach wrote in 1946, quote, it is exactly this attitude of someone who does not belong to any place and who is essentially a stranger without the possibility of being assimilated, which is desired and expected from me, end of quote. Coming from an assimilated German Jew expelled from his native country, Auerbach's words seem rather poignant. He understood his prescribed task in avowedly unassimilationist terms. Instead, he was called upon to conserve and embody his European identity as a model for the upcoming generation of Turkish students and scholars. Striking in this letter is Auerbach's clear-sightedness. He understood that Turks wanted him to remain an eternal guest. In contradistinction to what was expected of Jewish Turks, however, his assimilation was not desirable. Without speculating about Auerbach's cultural aspirations, it is possible to say that the emigre's choices were strictly limited. Not to assimilate guaranteed Auerbach's success as the model and translator of European scholarship, and this in itself secured him respect and safety in Turkey during the war. Yet the case of Auerbach in Istanbul also tells us something about models of integration and assimilation. Whereas even today, cultural assimilation is seen as mandatory in countries of immigration, Auerbach's example shows that the exact converse was meant to promote the national project in Turkey. Accepting this condition and personifying the European intellect allowed Auerbach to survive the Holocaust 
and Turkey, on the other hand, to propel its nationalist reforms. The status of German Jews seen initially, so as to speak, a valuable people without a nation or religion, became increasingly precarious, however. It is a little appreciated fact today that Jewish refugees were not welcome in Turkey unless they were brought in for, for national needs, as the Prime Minister Refik Saidan declared in 1939. Rising anti-Semitism among Turks and repeated attempts by Nazi authorities to destabilize the emigres' influential position all impacted their status. I'm just briefly going into one episode and then I'm, I'm done. In fact, anti-Semitism in Turkey reached a critical level in 1942 when the prime minister declared that, quote, Turkey cannot be a homeland for those who were unwanted elsewhere, end of quote. This effectively put a stop to the immigration to Palestine via Turkey. Turkey's refusal, refusal to help Jewish refugees was a precursor to Turkey's own anti-Jewish tax legis legis legislation, which distinguished between Muslims, non-Muslims, dönme, and foreigners, the, so the Varlok Vergesse. Jewish Turks who could not pay the property tax were sent to labor camps in 1942. Popular anti-Semitic mobilization at the time can be best traced in leading national newspapers and they, they cast doubt upon the loyalty of Turkish Jews to the Republic. While anti-Semitism in Turkey indeed never came close to the level of persecution realized by national socialists, Jews, German and Turkish Jews alike were constantly reminded of their precarious situation. When Auerbach reviewed his situation in a letter after the war, he wrote, quote, against all odds, we are well. The new regime did not penetrate the Bosporus. We lived in our apartment and didn't suffer anything worse than minor troubles and fear. Until the end of 42, things looked really bad, but then the cloud was slowly lifted. Indeed, the labor camps for non-Muslim minorities were closed in 43, the outstanding capital tax debts released, and the anti-Semitic atmosphere lost some of its intensity. I'll leave it here um, uh, with this one quote that I found, Tomek, where Auerbach actually uses the word fear, so I was looking for it to actually refer to it tonight. And I also want to close thanking the, um, the Kulturwissenschaftliches Institute for being partner of the Academy in Exile and also Egemen Özbek, who is the coordinator of, uh, of, of the Academy at the KWI. Um, so thank you very much for giving me this opportunity today. Alfred, thanks, Professor uh, Konok. Uh, I really appreciated the new notion of reciprocity in uh, looking at exile. Uh, 